What is going on guys? It's the Mad Dragon. Week 3 is now over of the Autumn International, so I thought I'd do a bit of a roundup video. We'll spend about two minutes on each game, what we thought happened on the weekend, and the good and the bad points that went on. And then finally we'll talk about the Super Brew we've got going on, the Fantasy League. We'll have a bit of a look at how all the results went, because I personally am quite happy this week. Uh, so starting off, let's start off with the first game that went on. So Scotland versus South Africa. Now a lot of people were commenting on this. People were saying don't rule out Scotland they could be looking for this one this could be one of the bigger upsets of this series going on the world champs losing to Scotland Scotland on the way up Scotland have been doing pretty well to be honest they've had some good games they beat Australia the week previously um unfortunately it didn't go that way uh the final score 30 to 15 to South Africa so South Africa um looking very friendly on that scoreboard in all honesty the game wasn't quite that uh, sort of extravagant it was definitely quite a close game all the way up until about 60 minutes I would say maybe 70 minutes even it went on for quite a while there were sort of alternating tries going on um, Scotland played well they obviously thought they'd target this game throw everything at this one and see how it went on I did say in the preview video to this one what I thought would happen is the first 40-50 minutes would be really tight and then it would be when those subs came on is where South Africa would begin to have that bit of difference come in and I think that was pretty much what happened um there was a couple of big areas for them that South Africa managing to win certain areas. Scotland will be quite happy with how long their scrum managed to held up against the uh, the South Africa onslaught. But there was a couple of issues for them. One being, I think, on that right wing. Tough day for Rufus McLean having to try and keep a hold of uh, Mpimpi. Thought he had a really good game managing to get around the outside. He got two tries himself. Stuart Hogg coming back and got his own two tries as well. as one incredible team-related offload passing tries going on. Fantastic to see Stuart Hogg going there. Uh, um, but it was that 60, 70 minutes, every scrum, as soon as that substitution lock came on, that Scotland scrum couldn't hold up. And it wasn't quite the same as what we saw in that Australia game where we had so many of the props going off for Australia. Scotland had to try and deal with South Africa and they just looked a little bit stronger overall. For South Africa, probably pretty, pretty happy with this result. They certainly had a bit of a tough fight going up against Scotland. A couple of people really sort of underwhelming, I would say, for South Africa. We know we have quite a few South African subscribers now. I mean, you guys must have thought as well, there was a couple of people, people that stuck out to me in that, um, I forget which way around it is, I think it's Herschel Yantes is the scrum half. I know there's Herschel and Elton Yantes. Um, the scrum half was very poor. Um, as soon as Kobus Reinach came on, we saw the difference immediately. Thought there was terrible play for him. I would I would have taken him off after about 25 minutes. Um, thought he was really, really struggling. And Vili LaRue, again, I, I'm so 50-50 on him as a player. Um, I thought some of the decision-making for him was very odd. Some of the kicking wasn't brilliant for him. Um, the defensive work wasn't brilliant. He came out the line two or three times, left a massive dog leg defence, which saw Scotland get around him for one of the second try that Stuart Hogg got. Um, was just, again, he came in really short. So definitely some areas for South Africa to work on there. Um, it wasn't a clean game by any means for them, but of course those penalties and Franz Stein with that ridiculous boot of his saw them to that 15-point lead. On to the second game then, Italy versus Argentina. And this is one of the ones that I was more excited about for this weekend. I thought this was going to be a really tight game. I thought an up-and-coming Italy team with a lot of new players, full energy coming off the back of some really good games. They come into this one, Argentina struggling against some of the big boys now. Uh, they've got their team down and solid. I thought it was going to be a really tight game. And it, it didn't really pan out that way, unfortunately. Um, it was by no means the best game we've ever seen from Italy in the world. There were a lot of mistakes in that game. Handling errors for both teams, but more so for Italy there it was a big situation problem for them. Um, the set-piece area... Uh, we thought the scrum would probably be under a lot of pressure from Argentina. Argentina like their scrum. Um, but the line-out specifically was such a massive issue for Italy. Um, they were just losing line-outs left, right and centre, overthrowing, not go or underthrowing at some points as well. We even saw that as well. Um, Argentina certainly outplayed in that game. And while the final scoreboard, 37-16 to 16 to Argentina... It doesn't look too disparate. Um, I really think Argentina would be quite disappointed not to have won by more, or at least more of a gap in there. Um, some of their own defence letting them down, which saw Italy getting over that try line as well. Um, and their own penalties, we know the discipline of Argentina not necessarily the best. That gave away a couple of three points here and there. Um, but Argentina played well. Julian Montoya, 
Um, brilliant in turnover rates. He was all over that game as a captain leading from the front. That's what you want to be seeing, as well as a couple of other players. Very, very tough game, very physical game. Um, but overall, Argentina just dominated that one um, from start to finish. I no point got the feeling that maybe Italy would be able to take that game. Real shame for them. Um, and I guess just another loss to tick off for, uh, for Italy along the way. On to the third game of the weekend, the biggest game arguably of the weekend. This is the one a lot of people are really excited to see, Ireland versus New Zealand. I, along with everyone in the Super Rugby, back New Zealand to win this one. I thought that the Ireland team was going to be going very, very strongly into this game. When we did the Six Nations uh, previews this year and I, I spoke about the team I think I had France down to win the last Six Nations before we really got into it before the teams were mentioned and after the teams got announced I actually had a bit of an underdog feeling that Ireland were going to win the Six Nations I thought the team they put in for that Six Nations was so strong so well gelled together so much experience now I thought this team is looking sort of coming out of nowhere but it's going to look very very strong um, they didn't manage to gel together as I wanted to see in the Six Nations but in this autumn series they are getting it together. They dominated Japan really well in that first game. And coming into this game, managing to beat the All Blacks 29-20 to in a classic Ireland-New Zealand fashion. A really hard-fought match. Both teams go in the full 80 minutes, wanting to show off. Um, but some superb, superb work. James Lowe having a really good game um, against the nationality he was born into. Coming in now for Ireland, having a really good game for him. Um, I thought there was maybe a bit of a mistake not putting Tyburn on to start off with, but I think the setup, letting Keelan Doris do his thing, bring Tyburn on in that second half just to bring in your new refreshed line jump and also the turnover jackal player. Brilliant, brilliant move from Andy Farrell. Um, I thought Ireland played really, really well in that game. And not to take too much away from New Zealand, I thought they played pretty well. Um, we saw in that game last week there was a few cracks and a few errors coming in, but that was very much because it was a bit of a B team. Um, this was now a much more fully-fledged New Zealand team. We're still seeing those issues. And it goes a little bit with what I've been saying for quite a while now, that the way to beat New Zealand is to just go for them. Uh, don't hold back. It's one thing I get really annoyed at when we see Wales. Wales are very much an absorbing team. They back their defence. They believe they aren't going to concede the points. And it just doesn't work against teams like New Zealand because that's exactly what they want. Someone like Ireland will go in there be full on attacking, play like New Zealand against New Zealand because they're not used to being on the back foot and they actually really struggle in so many areas when they're put under constant pressure and that's what we got to see in that game. It's why South Africa beat them. It's why we're seeing England beat them in the semi-final. It's why Ireland have gone on to beat them here and I hope other teams begin to take note now New Zealand aren't invincible anymore. They are the team that if you go for them, you can beat them. And I look forward to see the France-New Zealand game next week. There was, of course, was another game going on, which probably a lot of people won't know about. It's not televised anywhere. It's not one that I could see. And that was Portugal versus Japan. Japan managed to win that game 38 25 so the Japan team obviously stepping up from that game we saw against Ireland that'll give them a bit of a boost for next week um, Portugal I mean we need to talk about Portugal because Portugal last week beat Canada uh, you know which is a, a World Cup entry team most years you see Canada in there Portugal beating them 20 to 17 last week and in this game they were only 13 points off Japan, who were going on to beat Ireland and Scotland in the last World Cup. So Portugal, not a team I know a lot about, but they're really seeming like they're moving up in the world as a Tier 2 nation, or maybe Tier 3. I don't even know what you class Portugal as, but not a team I've ever got to see. I couldn't tell you a single player for them, but they are up and coming. And maybe, maybe not the 2023 World Cup, but maybe moving towards that 2027 World Cup, we might be seeing Portugal get in. And I can't wait to see some of these lower-end teams getting. So best of luck to them, but a good win for Japan. Japan. Finishing off our Saturday then was, of course, England versus Australia. This was always going to be a real sort of clash of titans, as you like to see. Um, England coming away with a win in this one, 32-15, um, which is pretty much what I thought was going to happen. I think my prediction was England to win by like 16. The difference was 17, so that's pretty close. Um, England came in with a very strong team, uh, considering Eddie Jones talks about hacking out 30% of his team. It's almost like the team you saw in the Six Nations or in the World Cup. Anyway, a couple of changes. Uh, we got to see Freddie Stewart getting in there, getting his own try. That was nice to see. Um, he's got a bit of a career, hopefully, in that England team. Um, a couple of other players playing really well, using players in very different ways. Um, Itoje doing far more ball carrying than I'm used to now, rather than being the tackling, jackling sort of player. Um, Curry, Underhill, these players now really beginning to solidify 
solidify their game. I think that England team looks strong. It wasn't necessarily the strongest Australian team that could be put out. They have got players missing. Um, and I thought Australia were playing pretty well. I think England will be very happy with how they managed to get on again, that scrummage department. We saw Scotland last week managing to just topple over that Australian scrum, but it was down to a couple of injuries um, or yellow card situations even in that game. Um, England, on the other hand, though, just managing to outmuscle that scrum. A really, really big move. Michael Hooper going off at one point as well will have been a big blow to them. Um, but I think the farrell Marcus smith axis is working well. We saw them working in good partnership. It's only upwards from here. It's the first time we've really Really got to see it so it's only going to be improved from there um there's a couple of really good players i think england will be getting excited now looking ahead towards that world cup they're beginning to reset their team now put in some of the new players some of the old boys and they're generating a team and this is an australian team that's been playing well um they're certainly not coming away with some of the results they would want they they, they could have won the game against scotland they could have won more games against france in the summer series um, they beat South Africa. There's results in there, but they'll be wanting it to do a little bit better. Um, and maybe once they get a full team together, they'll become more fearsome. But as a Wales supporter, uh, if Australia could just stay down there a little bit longer, uh, I personally would quite enjoy that one. On to the Sunday then, and we had France versus Georgia. This was a game that went uh, pretty much as... I expected it to go anyway. I expected it to be a bit of a first 40 slog match and then a second half to take over from France. Um, Georgia did well in a lot of areas I wasn't expecting them to. A lot of the set plays they were using actually coming off. A lot more of the back runners being used. We saw more loops. We see more of those wingers being used. Todua is a machine on that wing as well. He played really, really well. Um, they managed to come away. There was a 41-15 loss. But they managed to get 15 points, and while it doesn't sound like a big thing, we saw it back in the last Autumn Nations Cup, so they weren't scoring points. I think they got less than that against Ireland in that Autumn Nations series. We saw them score nothing against Wales, and I think they might have either scored nothing or like three points against England last year. Playing top-tier nations is hard to score points. It's one thing to not concede points, but also to score upon these teams. I think they won't be too unhappy with it. They certainly threw a lot at that game, and it was nice to see from them. France um, had a tough 20 minutes, to be honest. They The first 20 minutes, they really weren't getting off the line as much as they would want to. They weren't scoring the points. They did go a lot more for corners and stuff rather than going for the three points. Maybe that would have seen the game out a little bit more. They wanted to test a lot of different angles. It's a much bigger team than I expected to play Georgia. Um, but I think they'll be happy with some of those those set moves and stuff. They got out a couple of mall tries getting over there. A couple of the um, the back players working well. Uh, the only thing I would say for France is that the speed of the set plays being used, not necessarily the best. And a team like Georgia, where holes will open up in the defence and that back line won't always be a tight-knit, solid defensive work. I think against bigger teams, France might struggle with not getting that ball out quicker to the wing. Um, but overall, 41 points is a good score to put on any tier two side. Um, and I think for them, big positive. Beating that Georgian scrum in the first half, which not a lot of teams too. South Africa struggled to do it. Wales have struggled to do it. Um, and I think they'll be very, very happy that within about 10 minutes, France were already on top of that Georgian scrum. That'll be a big thing, especially with the New Zealand game coming up next week. Really, really big reinforcement for them. And the final game of the weekend, Wales versus Fiji. I got to go see this one at the Principality and what a, <laughs> what a long day that was. Um, certainly going to be a tough game. Um, Wales are missing a lot of players. I've seen different numbers thrown around anywhere from sort of 16 to 21 uh, of the starting sort of 30 players you might want to name on that Wales team sheet. I don't believe it's that high. Um, I'm sure there are those injuries, but they've still got a decent team. Um, it was reflective of, not necessarily necessarily a starting team but it was it was closer to a starting team than a b team i would say this team that went on to play fiji in the preview video for that i talked a lot about the issues in this wales team now i had no idea why josh adams was coming on to come on at center especially with some of the skill talent that is there and not being utilized correctly jonathan davis going in at 13 we don't see nick Tompkins playing 13 who plays 13 very well when he gets the chance scott williams being sent home to the scarlets rather than being able to play in this game a real shame for him um we did have an injury there was josh adams got injured in the warm-up um and just and just went off the field so we got to see nick Tompkins come on who i thought actually had a relatively decent game um throughout that thrown in last minute getting in there and Tom Francis has got a concussion during the warm-up before arriving at the stadium. 
uh, how intense the warm-ups are in uh, in that Wales camps, I don't know. Um, but I thought Fiji played really well. Unfortunately, they didn't come away with a win. Wales won that game 38-23. to And for a lot of that game, it looked like it wasn't going to be a Wales win. Um, it's only through some of the magic of people like Reese Zamet that that win is even achievable. I don't think that score is overly reflective of how that game went. I thought Fiji were all over that game for at least... I don't know, 40 minutes of that game, I think were dominated by Fiji. And they were also forgetting about the fact that Fiji got a red card, what was it, like 20-something minutes in? They were down to 14 men for an hour of that game um, and also had two yellow cards along the way. So there was 20 minutes of that game where they had 13 men um, and Wales still not crossing the line. It's a real testament to how well Fiji are playing, not just that Wales not really reaching the mark. Um, I think Wales will be happy to have come away with a win there, but Fiji playing really, really well. Um, I think had the red card not come and those yellow cards not king kicked in quite as soon, I think Fiji could have looked to have won this game. Reese Samet having one try disallowed, which was very, very tight. There's a lot of, of rugby rules going on there. But managing to get his try, I mean, if you take off the Reese Samet try that he had no right in scoring, but just shows how skilled the lad is to actually score that try at the end. Um, you know, you put this game down at 31-23, an eight-point difference. I think that was probably more fair um, I, I really think Wales are going to struggle. But going on next week against Australia, going to be very, very tough. I think Fiji are going to look to have maybe a good series. It's going to be a tough World Cup in that group. I think Fiji will be a little bit disappointed, but again, not necessarily the best Fiji team we could have seen. I mean, Fiji are up and coming. I really hope in the future we get to see a bit more money, a bit more coaching and a bit more push for Fiji to move up in the world. Um, because I really think they've got in with a chance of getting out of those group stages eventually, Fiji. I think they're on for a really good World Cup. But there we have it, guys. That's quite a basic roundup of what happened this weekend. Obviously, there were some really, really big games in there. Make sure you drop down in the comments what you thought your favourite game was and some of the big results you thought. Speaking of results, we need to move on to talk about the Super Brew. This is the fantasy league we've got going on on the channel. There's a couple of people involved, which is a lot of fun to get on with. So, talking about this round, uh, I'll chuck on screen for you guys over here um, the round as it went on. So, uh, here's the final results for the round. I find myself at top on 10 points. Wilford Rice coming up very close on 9.5. Bowie on 8.5. And David sort of very close as well in that eight region. Um, the rest of the scores there for you guys. Uh, big one here though, Sam dropping down there on 6.5 was a, a big uh, big call there. So I'm managing to just outreach David. So looking at the actual leaderboard results, uh, we see me taking back over that lead and it's so tight, it's so tight now. Me on 23, David is there on 22.33. So it's about half a point, 0.7 of a point behind me. So that's like one call correct in this final week and finally Bowie there on 20.33 so to me pretty much now it's I, I would imagine going to be a bit of a three horse race unless um, Lord Nicholas or Wilfred Rice has a cracking round um, and we all do quite terribly I imagine you might only really see a swing of two or three points so I think it might be a three horse race but there's certainly a chance for some other people to sneak maybe that third position maybe a second position there um, one of the big ones here that Sam Sam down there, I'm sure you'll drop down in the comments, Sam, what happened to you there? This might be the first <laughs> Super Brew where I actually get to beat Sam. I was a personal win for me, but it'll be, of course, the way things tend to go. So I'll probably beat Sam and then lose to Dave. will probably overtake me. That's how that's how the world works, isn't it? Um, so in terms of talking points, um, not a great deal of talking points. No one going particularly outrageous this week. Uh, there were certainly some results that no one picked, one of which being the New Zealand result. Um, everyone picked New Zealand to win that game, which was quite astonishing. I, again, didn't get my bonus point even though I was the closest because I was out by two you needed to be within 15 I was within 17 so I still don't get my bonus point for that I believe I lost a bonus point somewhere else as well for not being the closest which is quite annoying <laughs> this bonus point system needs to be changed um, I could be storming ahead here um, but I had an all right round to be honest uh, it certainly got better towards the end um, but there was some big up and coming rounds there but well done to everyone who is taking part of course we have one week left now um, it can all change it's certainly going to be a tough fight in that top spot now there's three of us really in for that running looking forward to see how it goes on but of course there will be some more rugby going on this week we'll be doing the preview videos as we always do that come out on the Thursday 
and sort of Friday now just because of how the teams lay out. There's always one team that won't put it out to the Friday for some reason. So they sort of overlap to Friday. So make sure you're subscribed to the channel just to keep up to date with all those videos as they come out. And if you enjoyed this one and you enjoy a bit of the rugby content, make sure you drop this video a like as it does really help the channel out and it is really appreciated. But I can't wait for another great round of rugby next week, guys. There's some big games coming up like Wales versus Australia, France versus New Zealand. It's going to be fantastic. So I can't wait to watch those games. But I hope you've all enjoyed today, guys. And I will see you next time. Bye-bye.